So the story goes, if you were to go on a pilgrimage up a tall mountain in maybe India or somewhere, you'd find at the top of that mountain a wise old guru. And if you ask that guru, what's outside this universe of ours? He would certainly tell you that this universe of ours sits on the back of the world turtle. And if you were to ask him, well, what is the turtle on? He would say, it's on top of an even larger turtle. And you wouldn't be blamed for being a little bit exasperated in asking, yeah, what's that turtle on? And you could pretty much count on him to tell you with a wise, patient, knowing look in his eyes, it's turtles all the way down. I partly love that story just because it's a like 3,000-year-old recursion joke. But I think there's something more we can learn from those turtles, so we're going to get back to them. I want to take a poll with you guys. It's an easy test. I'm going to give you two choices, OK? Choice A, you can deliver $1 million of value to the business that you work for. 100% guarantee. Okay? Choice B, you have a 1 in 100 chance of delivering a billion dollars of value to the business that you work for. Who's going to take choice A? Who's going to take choice B? <laughs> All right. You passed the math test. Choice B is, yes, worth 10 times as much on an expected utility basis as choice A. Most of you just identified yourself as moonshot thinkers, by the way. But here's the tricky bit. Are you in a context where you can let that opinion of yours, that way of being, out? Where you work, where you study, does it support you thinking that way? You are a rocket ship, and you have it in you to light your own fuse. But it won't happen unless you're somewhere that wants you to do it. Historically, there have been times and places where a set of extraordinary people were put together with significant resources and given both the pressure to go really fast and the freedom to be as weird as necessary to make something incredible happen. Sadly, perhaps, most of those situations were in the cause of warfare. Places like the innovations that happened uh, around cryptography and the invention of modern computer science at Bletchley Park, or the harnessing of the atom at the uh, Manhattan Project. But in honor of one of the few non-military endeavors of this sort, let's call this way of thinking moonshot thinking. We'll think of the speech that JFK gave at Rice University and the Apollo 11 mission to the moon that came after that. But why do we have to wait for a war in order to think really big, to think radically far outside the box, to attack audaciously at 10 times, not at 10%, the world's biggest and most pressing problems. Not all crazy ideas are worth doing, of course. Moonshot thinking is, starts with picking a really legitimately huge problem. If you pick something that you're the only person in the world who thinks it's important, that's not moonshot thinking, no matter how hard it would be to get it done. You have to pick a problem that's global in scale, that would matter to an enormous number of people. Then, you have to make some kind of science fiction sounding proposal, a product or a service that would make that problem go away. And even those two aren't enough. A time machine would probably satisfy those two, but I don't know how to make a time machine. Come see me afterwards if you do 
or you can see me before the talk, I suppose. <laughs> but you have to be able to articulate some reason to believe that we can make this science fiction sounding thing happen. Some piece of science or technology or engineering, a breakthrough that makes it at least possible that we could get it done. I have the incredible good fortune to work at a place that has made moonshot thinking its mission. The mission at Google X is to work on moonshot scale technologies outside of Google's core mission that if we could make them, would make the world a radically better place. That means picking things that are uncomfortably ambitious, things that often defy logic or credibility or seemingly science, sometimes all three at the same time, unfortunately, but to be determined that there is something worth doing that would matter to the whole planet and that there's some reason to believe we could actually get it done. So before we celebrate that too hard, why does that matter? Is it really important? Is thinking that audaciously, thinking 10 times instead of 10% worth it? Why shoot for the moon? Icarus died and Daedalus lived, right? We have these parables about doing the opposite. It matters. It matters because when you try to do something that is radically hard, you solve the problem differently, you approach the problem differently than when you try to make something incrementally better. If you attack the problem as though it were solvable, even when you don't know how to solve it, determined not to use any of the tools that you started with, you will be shocked what you come up with. Sometimes it's harder than making an incremental improvement. But it's a hundred times more worth it. It's never a hundred times harder. Let me give you an example. There's a psychology experiment from about 35, 40 years ago called the mutilated checkerboard problem. Have you ever heard of it? So in this particular psychology experiment, the subjects are sat down, each subject is, is presented with a checkerboard and a set of 32 dominoes. The checkerboard has 64 squares on it, in case you haven't looked recently. And each of these dominoes can perfectly cover either one horizontal or vertical pair of squares. And the researcher asks, can you cover all 64 of these squares with your 32 dominoes? And pretty much all the subjects, independent of their IQ, say within 30 seconds, yeah, duh. But then the researcher gets a little devious. She cuts the top left corner and the bottom right corner off the checkerboard. And she takes away one of the dominoes. And she says, OK, you still have two dominoes, or sorry, two squares for each domino. Can you cover the board with your dominoes still? And now every subject, virtually every subject, independent of IQ, stalls indefinitely. They just never figure it out. They can't come up with a solution, and they can't prove that there isn't a solution. But if the researcher writes the word salt, just the word salt, on the white squares, and the word pepper on the black squares, and peanut butter and jelly turns out to work pretty well, too. Now, everyone, independent of IQ, within 30 seconds, gets the right answer. Nope, it's not possible anymore. The reason is because each domino covers a pair of squares, one white, one black, no matter how you orient it, and you've just removed two white squares or two black squares, two salts or two peppers, depending on the orientation. But that aha takes a perspective shift that almost nobody can get, but with that tiny piece of help, they can get it. Perspective shifting is so much more powerful than being smart. If you try to make an improvement, you are almost by definition 
in a smartness contest with all of your peers and everyone who's come before you, you're probably not going to win. But if you try to do things 10 times bigger, you have no hope of getting that done using traditional methods. You have to rely on bravery and creativity and perspective shifting. And just like the mutilated checkerboard problem, that perspective shifting is what introduces the magic and makes seemingly impossible problems all of a sudden tractable. It's for this reason that culturally, Google X is a bit more like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory than it is like a classic innovation company or group. Think sort of Peter Pan's with PhDs. Responsibly irresponsible behavior is vigorously encouraged. And failure is OK. It has to be OK. Because if failure isn't a significant outcome, if it, happens, if it doesn't happen at least half the time, we're not shooting big enough. And you have to have people, inventors, makers, engineers, who get that. That's culturally what we have evolved into because we understand what the mutilated checkerboard is saying, that it's about the salt and pepper. It's about the peanut butter and jelly. It's not just about how many IQ points you have. And these people, then, they understand that their mission is to think really audaciously, incubate magic, focus not just on some proof of concept, but actually getting something out into the world and having impact in the world, and then worrying later about making money on it. And that last point may seem a little bit like uh, throwaway, but it's not, actually. It's really important to what Google X is like and why we do things the way we do them. Doing them in that way is, in fact, really stitched into the DNA of Google. So Google has historically, with Search with Android, with Maps and Street View, with Translate, to name a few, has worried afterwards, sometimes years after the launch, how to make money on it, and relied on the sense that if you're adding huge amounts of value to the world, the money will come back and find you. And so that's core to how Google X approaches these problems. At the beginning, if we want to set up this little mini Apollo 11 mission to solve some problem in the world, we'll make sure then, does this add a huge amount of value to the world if we could get it done? But once we satisfy ourselves that that's true, we can put away for a long period of time what we might call a classic business plan. Just don't worry about it. Just go make something that is hugely valuable to the world, actually get it out into the world. It doesn't count if you don't do that. And then, later, trust that the money will come back to Google in an elegant and fair way. And when you think that way, when you don't think about the money, you think about the impact and the positivity of the impact. You solve different problems and you solve them differently. So our, our process at Google X starts with looking at hundreds of ideas every year. We white paper some of them. We actually go do dil due diligence outside of Google X with some people and on some ideas. We prototype, prototype a lot of things inside of Google X. And then we throw almost everything away. And we don't look at the stuff that's bad. Most of this stuff had some chance. But even after you don't start with the really dumb ideas, with the obviously crazy stuff, and you look through these hundreds of things, you have to throw almost everything away. And you have to have a group of people who are dedicated to throwing almost everything away. And what we're left with is starting two or three new projects every year. It's also part of our process that we're trying to graduate things from Google X. You can't have Peter Pans with PhDs and go past a certain point in the commercialization of those projects without losing some of the Peter Panishness. So you need to keep 
uh, the system flowing and you need to have things that are moving out as well as into Google X in order for a place like that to really function in the way I'm describing. Let me give you two examples that you may not know of. Presumably people here know of uh, the self-driving car work that we've done and Google Glass. But here are two other examples. So you may have noticed, some of you, that the little blue dot on Google Maps now works inside. It didn't used to until about 15 months ago. And you could say, some people did, eh, who cares? I already know what building I'm in. Does it really matter? Yeah, actually, it does. We had old style maps, but I don't think many people would want to argue that it hasn't meaningfully changed our world and for the better, that you can now find any physical place, any building from anywhere in the world. That is a radical and positive transformation in our society. To be able to do that inside a building, to know how to get to gate 27C, or how to find a specific thing in something like a mall, Solving those kind of problems will be just as transformational. So when we started at Google X on this project, we thought we were gonna have to put up satellites. That's actually why we started at Google X. Or maybe create an ecosystem of little beacons that would be put all over the world for indoor localization. It turned out that we didn't need to. We found a way that didn't require that. And partly because we did that, we, and we've been working with the Geo part of Google the whole time. We spun it out of Google X into Geo, where it now is, and is hopefully adding value in your lives, and will more over time. As a total aside, I actually think the next order of magnitude will matter just as much. This is a different 10x from going 10x bigger. This is like 10x smaller. But going from a error rate of I don't know, 25 meters, which is what GPS kind of is outdoors, to two and a half meters, which is what Project Insight is shooting for, it's gotten pretty close to. Getting down from there by another order of magnitude to 25 centimeters, about like that, knowing where you are within that distance, that much error, is going to matter just as much. I'm a little hazier on why, but I'll take that bet against anyone who wants, because each order of magnitude tends to matter in those kind of ways. Here's another example. We uh, started a project uh, a little over two and a half years ago called the Google Massive Neural Network Project. The thinking there was people have been making slow and steady progress in the field of artificial intelligence for a long time. And most of the work has traditionally been on changing the algorithms. But what if it actually was a scale issue? What if you needed to get a lot closer to the scale of the human brain before things took a big qualitative jump in performance? Could we, by going up by about four orders of magnitude, in the architecture and or in the data presented to the architecture, for some neurally inspired computational system, actually be able to accomplish tasks much better than had otherwise been possible, that were useful to human beings in all kinds of ways? And it turns out the answer is yes. But it was much harder than it looked at first, as most of these things are, because training something that looks roughly like a neural network over tens of thousands of computers uh, turned out to be highly non-trivial. So we got together a group of some of the best engineers and scientists in the world on these fronts. And they spent a bit over a year working on this problem. In the particular, uh, the first two domains that they were looking at were recognition problems. One of them was a visual recognition question. Is this picture, does this picture have a cow in it? And uh, speech recognition problems. What word was that? And once they were getting better results in both of those areas, particularly the speech recognition one, then anyone anywhere in the world had ever gotten, and with arguably, in some ways, much less complicated or sophisticated algorithms than other people had used, we thought they're ready. And so we spun them out from Google X into the part of Google called Google Knowledge, 
where they are today. They're working now on even larger architectures, even larger data sets, and they're working on more applications like video understanding, natural language understanding, and other areas as well. So what don't we work on? Uh, it can't be everything. That's not much by way of focus, right? The two examples I just gave you we're very proud of having made at Google X, but both of them, it turned out, did not require custom hardware. We thought in both cases they would. And so both the fact they were ready for commercialization, but also the fact that they, were not, they did not require hardware made them more appropriate for the main part of Google than for Google X. Generally, we're not gonna do anything that's not Google-y, that is, anything that we feel is even near a moral gray area. But if you take aside anything that makes us feel even mildly queasy, and you put aside any sort of pure computer science, require that we have to do things that have to survive contact with the physical world in some hard and interesting way, we're pretty much gonna consider anything in this space. It could be agriculture, it could be energy, you already know about a transportation example we're working on. It could be robotics. You know a human-computer interaction one we're working on. Manufacturing. Anything which is a huge problem for humanity, we'll sign up for it if we can find a way to fix it. One of my like, big discoveries that I had in the last three years while we've been building up Google X is that who you bring in and how you install them there and how they feel afterwards can itself be a moonshot. I never really expected to see what I now see, which is Google X teaming with people, many of whom used to run their own companies or large labs. Some of them had 20 people reporting them, some people had 5,000 people reporting to them. And these people often come with no team, with no plan. Why would they do that? It's because, like all of you, what, what we all want, it's not money, it's not fame. We want to work on something thrilling that really matters, that pushes us to our limits, and that happens that we get that experience in the presence of people we deeply respect. And now I see some of these people with a soldering iron in their hands, or literally with mud on their boots looking so happy I'm jealous and I think, how can I trade jobs with them somehow? I'm gonna give you a homework assignment that I give as a thought starter to most people soon after they start at Google X. This is not a rhetorical question. I really want you to do this tonight over a beer. Ask yourself, or 10, <laughs> ask yourself what would I work on if I knew ahead of time that I wouldn't fail? And then ask yourself, why wouldn't you start that tomorrow? Homework assignment tonight. You don't have to be at Google X to take moonshots, obviously. One of my favorite examples is Elon Musk. I was talking here earlier this week. How many of you saw him speak? He's like a national treasure. Uh, seriously. It's, it's not just that he's built some exciting and uh, really meaningfully positive things. PayPal, SolarCity, Tesla, SpaceX. That's great. but he's like a walking moonshot. He's so audacious, it seems limitless, and it's infectious, his energy and his belief that things are possible. He was telling me recently, I was at SpaceX, and he was saying that his plan for SpaceX is to dream big and pay the bills along the way. I love that. So good. And this is going to Mars. This isn't like getting some satellites up for people who will pay. That's the 
pay the bills along the way. The dream big, he's like serious. He's putting a colony on Mars. Makes the rest of us look like we're sleeping. It's not whether he succeeds or not. That's not important. It's not important at all. It's that he's trying to be an Edison. That's what matters. And this is not limited to the most brilliant people in the world. The world has more than enough problems. The world has more than enough money, whether or not you can see it. It's not limited by IQ. It's limited, we're all limited, by bravery and creativity. That's what you have to bring in huge amounts to add the kind of value and create the kind of things that Elon Musk creates. He's a very smart guy, but I'm willing to bet that lots of people in this room are as smart as he is. It's his bravery and creativity which makes him so exceptional. And you have that in you. I know you do. It's about letting it out. It's not just about bravery and creativity. There's at least one other thing that I would flag as critically important. And this one is harder to actually generate, to let out. Some people just don't have it, unfortunately. I was working with an entrepreneur recently, and he had what I thought was one of the strongest ideas I'd seen in a long, long time. He really had, I believe, sorted out a way to help people learn to program where they didn't even feel like they were learning to program. They felt like they were playing a game. Even if they didn't have inclinations toward programming, and he had the goal of teaching another billion people to write software. That's a moonshot. That's awesome. But he didn't have enough humility. You're going to fail all the time. And Elon Musk does too. It's not like everything goes right for him. You have to be willing to learn from your failures and accelerate with each one of your failures. Those are the moments where you get the acceleration. And he wasn't willing to ask for help. He wasn't willing to accept that he was wrong, which is the thing that is required before you can use the failure to accelerate. And so all of the bravery and creativity which he brought to that problem will probably never see the light of day. And that's really sad. You have to be humble on your way to audaciousness. You have to let go if you want to see it get big. We have a new Google X project that's a very exciting application of control systems in a field that I can't talk about yet, but soon, actually, just a month or so. And the team's been working on this for quite a while. The system that they're working on is very fragile, and I was extolling to Larry Page how good it is that the team has been able to take this still quite fragile system that they have and test it over and over again without ever breaking it. And so Larry told me, OK, you can have the money to do the project, but make sure you break at least five of them, the prototypes, in the near future. And when Larry says stuff like that, people are roll their eyes. But they're not listening. This is a moonshot in microcosm. Larry's reminding me, and I needed it, that if you're going slowly enough that you don't break your physical prototypes, you have no hope of going radically fast. He understands that at an intuitive level, not just an intellectual level. And that pushing is exactly right. He's saying, don't settle for that. Whatever it takes, you have to sign up for the radically fast, and that is an excellent piece of evidence that you're not there yet. That is moonshot thinking inside a moonshot. Sergey has, on more than one occasion, proposed putting a big ring of foam around the outside of the self-driving cars. And when he does this, the people at X mostly like roll their eyes again like that. But they're not listening. He's actually pushing and guiding very wisely. It's not that he thinks the cars are terribly unsafe. He knows that they're quite safe. But he wants them radically safe. It's not that he thinks that 
having a ring of foam around the outside of the cars will be some kind of ultra cool fashion statement. He knows that it wouldn't be. What he's saying is, guys, how far afield can you stretch your minds? How different can you make it? Imagine that you need to make it, make the self-driving cars not 10 times safer than human drivers, make them 100 times safer than human drivers. Now what are you gonna do? You don't like my foam idea? Awesome, go make a better one. That's what he's saying. That is moonshot thinking inside a moonshot. Moonshot thinking is fractal. A moonshot factory at its best is not just picking some big audacious goal whose success would really matter. A moonshot factory at its best applies that same kind of thinking to every corner of the problem and at every level of the problem. Who you bring in, how you install them in the team, that can be a moonshot. The architecture, the technical architecture that you pick for the thing you're doing, that can be a moonshot. How you fail, how you think about failing, how you plan to fail fast, that can be approached as a moonshot. I know it doesn't sound like it, but everything can be approached as a moonshot. That's actually what the turtles are telling us. Just like the turtles, it's moonshots all the way down. When you're practicing it, I promise you that you will be unstoppable. Thank you. So I left a lot of time because I figured it'd be more fun for you guys to get to ask some questions. Hopefully I've given enough like momentum that you guys are uh, interested. And I think there are a couple microphones roaming looking for people with questions. Yeah, actually, I didn't say the best scientists in the world. I said the bravest and most creative scientists in the world. I'm sure we don't have all of the smart ones. I know we don't have all the smart ones. I'm not even sure we have the smartest ones. You know, so let me elaborate on this, because I know that it sounds frustrating, but let me pick apart the frustration for a second. I hear this all the time. When I talk to small companies, they're like, yeah, whatever, Astro. Nice attitude, but we don't have the resources. That's for big companies that have the money to take moonshots, duh. But when I talk to the big companies, they're like, whatever, Astro, obviously that's not us. We're a big company. We buy innovation after it happens. That's not what big companies do. You have to take huge amounts of risk to take a moonshot. That was, you just ranted about that. That's what a small company does. That's not what the big companies do. You go to the academics, and they're like, well, I mean, we get paid to write about moonshots. We're not actually going to build one, though. <laughs> you go to governments, and they're like, well, that was 100 years ago. <laughs> Relax. You know, when we get to cash positive territory again, like, you can come talk to us about moonshots. Right now, we're not shooting for 10x. We're shooting for 1x. <laughs> so everybody feels like it's not possible, and that's what I'm trying to communicate. It's almost the essence of what I'm trying to communicate. The way out of that conundrum is it's about creativity and bravery. It's not the smartest people in the room. It's not the largest number of people. It's not the people with the most money. This is, you know, this is all well and good. You're throwing tons of money, tons of smart people at important challenges. But why can't I download and fork the source on an open source car, no matter how likely to explode, 
an open source self-navigating car as easily as I can code for Android or anything else. And isn't that what you need to do to really speed up innovation to where we need it to be? It's a fine question. Uh, there's a delicate balance, especially when you work when you work in software, you have various kinds of serious responsibilities about privacy and security, but it's pretty hard to kill somebody. <laughs> less true when you're making physical things, any physical thing. Even less true when that thing weighs two or 3,000 pounds and can go 70 or 80 miles an hour. So, you know, I love open source. I think we're a little bit away from open sourcing uh, self-driving cars. I'm not totally against somebody doing it. I personally agree with you that that would make certain kinds of innovation go fast. But, you know, I get crazy with regulators all the time. So this is not an apology for regulators. They make me bonkers. I wish they would get out of the way most of the time. But the truth is that regulation is at its best, a delicate balance of trying to keep people safe from irresponsible innovation while not getting too much in the way of real innovation. I don't think we have the balance right in this country, but for the same reason that the regulators may be missing a little bit but are trying to do the right thing, Google at least is not going to open source the cars until we could find a way to do that in a way where we don't have to feel bad um, when somebody does something with the cars. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, I heard you talking about Elon Musk and uh, his Tesla uh, cars, for instance. I was wondering um, if you could give any insights into collaboration with other companies, like will there be a self-driving Tesla car? Like, uh, or I saw that Mark Zuckerberg was wearing the Google Glass with Sergey Brin. Do you even collaborate or work together with other companies from Google X? So when you want to go ultra-fast, a working with anybody, even another ultra-fast company, tends to slow things down. It's a danger. On the other hand, trying to boil the ocean by yourself is even harder than boiling it with your friends, right? <laughs> Which we also know. So there are good moments for collaboration. Let me use one or two examples. With the self-driving car, you know, we haven't built our own cars. At first, we just bought Toyotas and, like, packed them the Prius. So we didn't like have some big business development deal with Toyota, we just did it. And that makes us go faster. But now, as you might imagine, we have lots of talks with large uh, car companies and tier one manufacturers because we're getting more and more thoughtful about that world and trying to plan five and even 10 years out. So that is sort of a shift that's happening for us there. Uh, Google Glass, many of you probably went and heard the talk by Timothy yesterday. That's another great example where we didn't try to get everybody into a big kumbaya, I mean, from outside of Google, in building it in the first place. We were very insular while we were building it, but we don't intend to stay insular, and that was the point of the talk, was that we're making APIs so that people can do things on top of what we've built. We're very interested in feedback, and so there are examples where we might be able to collaborate with others in a way that doesn't slow them down or slow us down. That's the aspiration, whether we do it perfectly or not. Would you describe this as, as turning up the difficulty level on the problems that you have until you are sure that you're going to stumble and that when you, so that when you do stumble, you're going to fall forward? Yeah, that wasn't my only point. So, the, you know, the saying goes, if you're not falling, sometimes you're not skiing fast enough or anyway, you're not skiing fast enough to learn quickly. So that was, I, let's say that's a secondary point. I'm actually trying to say something which is a little racier than that, which is that when you go slow enough, you inevitably start doing things the boring way. And you won't get anywhere interesting the boring way, the traditional way. When you shoot higher than is comfortable, it forces you out of your comfort zone. And when that happens, you tend, everyone tends, some people are better than others, but everybody tends to think differently. And when that happens, like the mutilated checkerboard problem, you can be surprised that what looked like a difficult problem is actually, if you're willing to be weird enough, not quite as difficult as you thought. So what I'm suggesting is that if you shoot instead of for a 10% improvement, for a 10 times improvement, 
I'm not promising you it'll always be easier, but I'm promising you it will rarely be 100 times as hard. It's just a better payoff for the world. My company, Integrated Roadways, builds information superhighways that monetize driverless while collapsing the user cost for adoption. What can I do to get involved with Google? Wow, that was uh, like a businessy mouthful. Um, <laughs> I, I hope I didn't sound like that. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> by the way, just uh, for those of you who are enjoying this, we have a solve, I'm gonna get to this in a second. Um, we have a solve for X talk um, and collaboration session from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. tonight. So one of the ways that you can get involved, so right when uh, we were starting up Google X, it was driving me crazy that I couldn't talk about what we were doing. And I just like, I'm because I'm a natural, I'm a sherry kind of guy. And because I just couldn't stand it, we started solve for X, which is a online community and an event which is designed to celebrate the ethos that I've been talking to you about today. Not to celebrate our ideas, but to celebrate yours. So this is, I'm gonna come back to Google in a second, but one of the things that you can all do is bring your ideas or the ideas of people that you think are radically great to solve4x.com. Become part of that community, come tonight to Bat Bar and be part of a live event that we're doing as we do it from time to time. So that, that's one answer. Uh, it's a walk-in, no pre-registration required. There, see, I did my job. Uh, and even kind of worked it in. The, the answer for getting involved with Google is, like, I mean, obviously, apply to be part of Google, be a developer on the Google platform, those are all good things. But I, that's not the message I'm actually trying to give you. You can be Google. I know you don't think it, but you can. Larry and Sergey, I don't believe we're going crazy, like, let's see how big we can think, when they said that they wanted to organize the world's information. I think the VCs beat them down to just doing that. Their inspirations were so much bigger than that, and they compromised in just doing that first. And that's part of why solve for x exists and why we're steeped in this ethos because we have those founder leaders. Coming to Google might be for you, but it's not required. That's what I'm saying is that their attitude more than their intelligence has created Google because they're willing to do these things that sound, they're like, it's so crazy, it just might be obvious. Don't worry about the money. Just make a ton of value for other people. Just solve their problems. The money's gonna come find you. And it sounds like something that all businesses should do, but they just absolutely do not do that. And Larry and Sergey are as serious as a heart attack about that. And if you are too, magical things will happen. That's what I'm telling you. Uh, yes, you, uh, you mentioned many different in industries that Google X is focused on. Are you guys taking any moonshots within the biology or genetics space? We're open to them. Uh, it's a little complicated. Uh, I have some healthcare background, but I have no serious biology background, uh, nor particularly does Larry or Sergey. And so we like those spaces. I personally believe that synthetic genomics is going to be for the next 50 years what computer science was for the last 50. So I think it would be a little bit sad if we don't. But it's also not in our sweet spot of, of expertise. We don't have those labs right now. It doesn't mean we can't make them. We've made other labs that we didn't used to have. But it's just gonna take a little bit of extra activation energy to get into one of those because of the due diligence required and, and the people and things like that. I certainly aspire to it, but it's, it's not the default. Can you please talk a bit about what you do at Google X to kind of create an environment of creativity, how you get you know, everyone thinking constantly? Uh, it sounds crazy, but just don't punish people when, they, when it doesn't work out. You know, I, I had this rant. We have a calibration session. The managers score 
all the people below them, and then some of the senior managers all get together, and we have these calibration sessions to make sure that if I'm giving you know, Bob a 3.7, and you gave Sally a 3.4, but they're actually really, when we look at them, they're kind of the same, we should calibrate that. And one of my rants during these sessions, it sounds little, but I think this is important for what you're asking, is I said, guys, because someone said something like, well, you know, they worked on it, but it turned out not to be what we needed. I said, no, 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 time out. If you ask Sally to move Mount Fuji two feet to the right, and she does it, we ought to give her like a triple promotion, even if it turns out they're like, oh, sorry, did I say right? I meant left. You know, that's not Sally's fault. Or maybe we don't know till, we, till Sally moves Mount Fuji two feet to the right that was the wrong mountain to move. But it sounds little, but you have to say, that was incredible, you moved a mountain. Or, you know, wow, you just tried 20 ways to move a mountain. None of them worked, but I love how you went at it. It's, you have to value the process. It's just what I said about Elon uh, Musk earlier. Whether he succeeds can't be the issue. I hate it that we celebrate the winners. That doesn't teach us anything since there's a lot of luck involved. We have to celebrate people who are running the right process, who have the right ethos. That's why Solve for X is not focused on people who are done, but on people who have a moonshot proposal. If they have the right format, huge problem, radical sounding solution, some kind of reason to believe that it's not totally crazy, if they can articulate that, they're, in, they're directionally correct, and we should celebrate them just for that. So in lots of little ways, what I would suggest is find ways to tell your people that you value the attempt, smart attempts, good risks, not whether they succeeded or not. Thanks. Hi. Um, I noticed during the talk you had an image, what looked to me was a space elevator. And I was just wondering if that is something that uh, Google X is, is looking into. And just in general, if that is, um, you know, space technology, space... You know, it's become like a, our mascot. Uh, <laughs> we're not making a space elevator. There's some very technical reasons why nobody's making a space elevator anytime soon. Uh, it turns out to be an incredibly hard problem. I think it's an exciting idea, but we're not making one right now. But it's our mascot because... Uh, the New York Times, I think, said that we were making one, and then Fast Company just repeated the fact that we were making one, and I just think it's so funny that people won't just, like, let us be. So <laughs> let me be specific about that. So we're not making a space elevator. People get irritated about the secrecy, but let me try to explain why we don't talk about things so we're ready to talk about them. Because I want you to understand us, but I also think it might teach you something that will help you. We don't talk about them not because we're pigs and we're just hogging the information. It's not because, you know, we're trying to like uh, let it out the back door so that everybody like lines up behind the velvet rope. We're not doing that like some companies. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's because we're gonna fail a good bit of the time. If I tell you we're making a space elevator, then everyone's like, when's the space elevator, Astro? And all of a sudden, I'm late if I don't have the space elevator to you in a, a year or two. And that's crazy. It ends creativity once you have that kind of external expectation on you, especially for a large company. And if I want the people, the last question that's just asked, to have the freedom to make mistakes, to try weird things, to be wrong, to start over again, then I can't have those expectations leaning over them while they're doing that. So that's actually the reason that we don't share this stuff, is not because we don't want to share it with you, I'm dying to share it with you, but I also want to protect the teams so that they can be weird in all the right ways. You know, uh, Neverland doesn't work, everyone can't be a Peter Pan if everyone's like, oh, that's not good enough, it just doesn't work. <laughs> My question has to do with like working as individuals and as teamwork, specifically in Google X, in terms of both innovation and also getting the work done, I mean, how does that work internally with you guys? And do you find that one works better for one process and one works better for the other? Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly, but the teams have very different styles. Uh, so it is not monolithic. And I will partly pretend that that's some kind of clever 
portfolio strategy on our part to try things out. And there's some truth in that. It's also just some managers are different. You can't make people manage the way you want them to manage. So we can exercise some influence by who we pick to run these projects, and hopefully some coaching will influence them. But they're still going to have their own innate styles. And I think that one of the most important things we can do is we can watch them, learn which things work and which don't, have them talk to each other a good bit, and then have the new projects, and this is exactly what we do, study the other projects and say, oh, what's working? What historically, what bumps did they hit in the road? How can we at least avoid those bumps so we can go on to newer, bigger, more exciting mistakes? I guess part of my question is, do the moonshot ideas come more from individuals or from the teams that you build? It's something of a variety. There's no uh, one answer to that. Ultimately, for us to put significant money into it. Larry and Sergey have to be behind it, but there's a lot of exploration that happens before then. Hey, great products and uh, great problems to work on. Uh, so my question is, when you identify problems uh, to work on, uh, work on, do you limit it to areas where, uh, where, it, where your core competency comes into play, which is, let's say, software engineering, or you say, let's identify a radical problem which has potentially uh, mass impact and then we'll build the talent and the expertise to work on it. Yes, it's the second. We are not limiting ourselves to software. I'm not even sure we're entirely limiting ourselves to engineering. We certainly aren't just limiting to software. Um, the question was asked earlier about biology, and I said, well, that's kind of in the gray area. I think you can approach many biology problems as engineering problems increasingly, but it's still hard. Um, because you don't want to be reinventing the wheel, and we have so close to zero expertise. Um, so you have to have some humility on your way up those ramps. But no, definitely not. You know, in machine learning and artificial intelligence, the joke, which sadly is not a joke, it's entirely true, is that it's 10% like the black art of machine learning or, or artificial intelligence, and 90% domain expertise. And you spend all this time like baking the domain specifics into whatever it is you're working on. It's the same thing with self-driving cars or Google Glass. Like, it looks like an engineering problem, but there's a ton of wearability issues and reliability and quality issues and safety issues and exactly how the world is set up in those very different ways. No, you have to sign up for very disparate trans disciplinary teams, you have to sign up when you start a moonshot to go find people who are the world experts in various different things. In optics, for example, if you're making Google Glass, and if there's no optics people at Google, that can't be like, oh, I guess we can't do that project then. Uh, Google X wouldn't work. Uh, thanks for sharing your point of view. I really love thinking this way, and I'm glad we can all stretch our brains. I think the your point about bravery and having a belief in yourself is definitely the core there. How do you frame your goals so that you don't end up homeless like Nikola Tesla or something at the end? And like, how do you so, frame the goals appropriately for where you are at this point in time? Um, I'll, I'll tell you a couple things. First of all, just like we shouldn't focus on the winners, I, I also would not encourage you to focus on the losers. It's not that you're wrong, he did end up sad and homeless. Uh, I think he was a pretty complicated person. I think he probably could have taken help. It was somewhat more offered, and he just wasn't willing to take it. So some of it was actually him, to be fair. And you know, there are people, maybe homeless is a strong word, but Elon Musk has gone all in several times, absolutely all in. So he wouldn't have been homeless, but he would have been not wealthy uh, several times. And he just believed in himself. And I think taking moonshots, it helps if your passion is bigger than your desire to protect yourself, to protect your emotional state, to protect your professional career. If those things are more important, your bank account, if those things are more important, I'm not sure moonshot thinking is the right thing for you. But if you're passionate about something, like obviously I agree not to be stupid, but there's, a, there's an interesting book called Deep Survival. It came out about 15, 20 years ago which was a psychology study of people who had been in outrageously hard circumstances, you know, 10 years in a POW camp without seeing light, you know, adrift in a, on a raft for 72 days with no water or that kind of thing, and survived and said, what do these people have in common? And one of them, to answer your question, was they had an audacious goal, 
to survive in this case. Um, the guy who had to cut his arm off and hiked out of the Colorado mountains was in the same circumstance. Uh, he came after that book, but he actually sort of linked up perfectly with these ideas. You have this really big goal to survive even though it shouldn't be possible to survive. But then you set yourself tiny little baby step goals along the way. Each one is within literally eyesight in most cases, or that you know you can accomplish. And then you say, I'm just going to get there and then I'm going to celebrate. And these people have tons of setbacks, but they just keep setting little tiny goals till they get one of them. And then they have a little moment of celebration. I can make it because I got that one done. And you keep going. I think there's a lot of truth in that, no matter how big your goals are. Thanks again for the talk. Can you give any other specific examples of failure or maybe projects that uh, didn't work out or you decided weren't for Google X besides the space elevator? <laughs> there are some examples I can't give, but here's one that just came to my mind. I remember we did a study on uh, reclaiming water in various states, particularly in California. And at first it seemed like a really interesting idea. Someone proposed, I don't even remember who proposed it. And it was going to be relatively cheap to reclaim a ton of water. Water is like worth more than oil is in California. And after some studying, it turned out it was just not a good idea at all. Because what was happening was that the water that we would be reclaiming, it was called falling from the sky, was going somewhere. And if you catch it, it doesn't go to the place that it used to be going. And so we just had to work on it for like a day or two to figure out, no, that one's not a good idea. So there's nothing wrong with reclaiming water in general, but in that particular case, the idea, the way of doing it just didn't make any sense. It didn't actually solve a problem. It might have made whoever built it a lot of money, but it would have stolen water functionally from the people who were counting on that water actually hitting the dirt and going to them. And so that's not making the world a better place. And it's totally aside from Googliness, I just don't believe that you can make money in the long run by stealing from somebody else like that. It's just better if you focus on things where everybody just wins. Hi. So I'm, I'm sure that your calendar is full all the time of people that want to pitch you ideas or want to get on the calendar to come up with new ideas. Are there any counterintuitive places that you rely on to find interesting new ideas or new concepts that aren't people just coming to you to pitch? Yes. Uh, that's part of why we created Solve for X in the first place. Because, so this is actually what happened in a tiny bit more detail. Right when I started, I thought that uh, we were, I was going to need some kind of pipeline for Google X. And so I thought, OK, been to TED. You know, there are lots of places like Davos, South by Southwest. Nah. None of them have a high density of what I would call moonshots. They, they occur in all of these places, but with low density. It's frustrating. I want to drink from the fire hose. Where can I go where I can drink from the fire hose? And I looked around, and there just wasn't a fire hose to drink from of that particular kind. So I decided, I'll make a fire hose. That'd be awesome. And then, within a few months, it became clear that we were not going to have a pipeline problem. There's just a lot of ideas, and they were coming to find us. So I said, OK, forget it. We're going to be so busy. Let's turn off. Let's not make the fire hose. And then Eric Schmidt said, no, no, the fire hose needs to exist. Then I got in the mode of, like, yeah, you're right. It, it does need to exist. And it's an opportunity for us to celebrate the one thing that we're allowed to talk about, even when we can't talk about specific projects, which is the ethos that's so important to us. And then Megan Smith joined me and, and Eric Schmidt and the three of us uh, sort of built up that place. So that's where I now go to look for these things because people are posting their own moonshots at solveforx.com. And because there's a rating system, if someone, God forbid, were to put up a cat video, hopefully it would get voted down pretty quickly, it seems to be. Um, so you don't have to watch the cat videos, you can just see the moonshot proposals. So that'd be my suggestion. I think we're done for the questions, I believe. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a great day.